Welcome back to the Testudo Talk podcast. As always, Emmett Siegel here with Andrew Chodis. Signing day just finished up, at least the first day of the early signing period here in December. In Maryland, their class has, for the most part, I think, complete. We're waiting on a couple guys maybe to see where everything goes, but you know, we have a pretty good look at the 21 guys that Maryland signed on Wednesday on that early signing day. Um, so, Andrew, I'll let you kick it off with your thoughts. Um, you know, like I said, 21 guys signed with Maryland. We got a couple transfers as well that we can talk about later in the episode, but uh, but first impressions of this class that Mike Loxley put together. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, obviously a very, very, very busy uh, few days. But I, I think overall, I think I think Loxley did. I think he did a pretty pretty fine job uh, with the class. It's not the most flashy, but I think there was obviously a huge emphasis um, on on the offensive line, which I know he said with us uh, over uh, uh, almost a third of the class uh, was on the offensive line. Obviously, I think. The, the big talk was the flip, uh, flipping Braden Lee from South Carolina, a four-star defensive back. So, I mean, overall, I mean, you, on, you only lost one guy, uh, Larry Tarver. You lost him to Nebraska. You kept, you know, 20 of your guys. And I think it's just a solid class overall. I agree with you. Um, I've said this, I think, on the podcast before, and it's kind of my take, is that, you know, Maryland isn't going to be the kind of team that's going to, you know, have yeah. top 20, top 10 classes. You know, that would be kind of a, a, a miracle if that were to happen. So, I think that this class is kind of exactly what Maryland needed. Like you said, they're kind of putting an emphasis on uh, on the trenches, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, um, to try and beef that up with some losses coming. I mean, you could be looking at losing pretty much your entire starting offensive line this year, depending on some decisions that we're waiting on. So I thought that was very good, and I thought they did a good job of that. Um, but Maryland, what they're going to be is not necessarily getting you know the flashy recruits. You use the word flashy, I'll use it as well. Um, not not necessarily getting you know the five star skill guys. You know they'll, they'll come along every now and then, right? You know, the Rakim Jarrett's will come along, the Stefan Diggs will come along. But but for the most part, that's not going to be the basis of a Maryland class like, you know, some of the teams maybe even in their own conference, like in Ohio State or whatever, that's recruiting at a completely different level. This is exactly the kind of class that I think Maryland should aim for and put together very well. Um, a lot of three-star guys, a couple guys that are composite four-stars at the top. You mentioned Braden Lee. There's also uh, Brandon Jacob, Dewan Williams, the running back. So you have uh, you have a pretty good mix of guys and these recruiting rankings are, are something, obviously. Um, four and five star guys pan out, make it to the NFL at a much higher rate than the three star guys. That's also partially because there's so many more three star guys. But uh, but you know, a lot of it's about development. Maryland is at its heart a developmental program, not necessarily uh, the program where you come in and are gonna you know immediately make an impact. So uh, so I like the way they put this class together. I think there's definitely some hidden gems in there. Um, you know, we're not obviously super familiar with, with all the players. Um, and we're not going to run down the list. You know, there's, like I said, there's 21 names, but uh, is there anyone that stands out to you as maybe a diamond in the rough or, or someone that you looked at as, you know, that was a really good signing that, that maybe people aren't talking about. I mean, I'm just going to say just from what I've read and, and kind of what I've seen, I know that there's been a lot of optimism over Therese Davis, um, a, a local offensive tackle. I know there's been a lot said about his athleticism. But like you mentioned, Maryland's a developmental school. Loxley even told us to this. He's not, not expecting really any of these linemen maybe to play in their first year or two. And we saw that in the past in the past 24 hours with some of the transfers they've landed, which we can uh, you know probably talk about in a little bit. But I think for me, I think Therese Davis would be one of those guys under the radar signings. I agree with you. Uh, Therese Davis, you know, DeMatha guy, he was on the podcast a couple months ago. Um, he gave us really good, <laughs> gave us a really good look at, you know, what it's like to, uh, to be recruited and, you know, why he chose Maryland, just, you know, staying local. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy that you look at as not super highly regarded because he hasn't necessarily been playing football for too long. And, you know, it has, hasn't necessarily caught the eyes of everyone, but, uh, but a guy that was, you know, getting some other calls towards the end of his yeah, recruitment the, um, and, you know, has really killed it for DeMatha playing in a really, really tough conference. Um, and you know, he were, he was a first team all met, I believe, um, which is, you know, no slouch. There's a lot of really good players in the area. Um, so, so yeah, he's, he's a guy that I would look at. Um, you know, there's a bunch of guys on this list. Uh, Keyshawn flowers yeah. is a linebacker from, from Spalding that, um, I've heard at least a couple things from, from some people I know that are covering football in the area, at least high school football that have, that have said, you know, he's sometimes the best player on that field. You know, he, he's, his quarterback is a four or five star recruit Malik Washington, um, and people are saying Keyshawn Flowers might be, you know, one of the better players on that Spalding team. So, so he's a guy I would look at as well. Um, and then, the, you know, Ryan Howerton's uh, another offensive lineman that's kind of, I think, risen in the rankings a little bit. Yeah. Best nickname of the class, I think we can all agree, the Mountain, right? Absolutely amazing nickname uh, for Ryan Howerton. And then, you know, there's a bunch of other guys down that list. Um, 
let's talk about some of the stuff that went down on signing day. You know, yeah. some some of the uh, the back and forth, some of the, uh, you know, there's always a surprise or two when you have Mike Loxley as your coach on signing day. Um, we can start with Braden Lee flipping from South Carolina. You know, the Maryland to South Carolina, the whole flip situation, it's been so well documented, the Jay Sean Barham debacle where South Carolina people are saying that it was orchestrated in advance, his flip, um, Maryland denying it. And then, you know, they were battling for Nicholas Harbor last year. Um, and then uh, and then this year, you know, Braden Lee flips from South Carolina to Maryland. Obviously, there's some accentuating circumstances. We um, chose to stay local. Obviously, a very tumultuous year. But, uh, but you know, that aside, Maryland getting a guy of his caliber, a four-star player, at least in the composite rankings. Um, first reactions when you saw Braden Lee make that uh, make his announcement that he was flipping to Maryland and kind of just speaking on this class as a whole, what they were able to pull off on signing day in particular. Yeah, well, I think as a whole, I I think to to retain most of your commitments, I think is is a positive sign, especially for Maryland, a program which you know in the past we we've seen a lot of their players um get poached. But Braden Lee, it's a huge get, especially it's at a position of need as well in the secondary, which Maryland they're losing a couple of starters to the NFL draft um at that position. But yeah, again, to take South Carolina had one of the top recruiting classes, uh, top twenty, I I. I I believe in the uh, in the country this year, and to be able to fl- to flip a guy of his caliber, like you mentioned, um, a four star player, and have a guy again, it's the whole DMV aspect. You know, well, where else you want to play besides home? That 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 whole motto. So you know, to to continue, you know, to kind of continue that. You know, you get Rakeem Jarrett a couple of years ago. Not saying Braylon's at that level, he's not, but but to get a four a four star recruit and keep him home, I think that's a, a good sign for the program. Something something that I was pointing out um on on social media and on our signing day tracker on testudotimes.com, which is you know, we were giving live updates and you know individual stories for every signee is that Mike Loxley has flipped a blue chip recruit, meaning a yeah. four or five star. Um, that's the past four years he's done that. Um, and then his first year. Isaiah Hazel was a was a four star recruit. He flipped from West Virginia a couple of days before signing day. So you know you're always looking at at Mike Loxley as a guy that that's got a trick up his sleeve. Um, you know we'll see maybe as another trick up his sleeve. Jordan Seaton, we're kind of well, waiting on him. We're recording this Thursday night. You know we thought maybe we were gonna hear something about him. You know the five star offensive lineman. Yesterday, you know we're kind of just in a waiting pattern. You know see if he'll flip from Colorado. But but that aside, you know you get a guy like Braden Lee, like you said. Four star flipping from an SEC school that that's done well recruiting at least in recent years in the DMV um, is obviously pretty important. Maryland, you mentioned it uh, right when we were you know introing this, but uh, Larry Tarver flips from Maryland to Nebraska. It felt Unexpected. like that was yeah. yeah that was kind of in the works. wasn't necessarily super surprising, but then Maryland rebounds. Judah Jenkins commits and, and then signs later in the day. Um, he's a guy that I would look at like I was saying earlier. You know some of these sleeper guys that you might not think about. Um, He's a cornerback for good counsel, a local school and only, um, and they were probably the best team in the DC area this year, at least one of them. Um, he's a three time all WCAC player for anyone that's not familiar. And I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to this are, and I've probably mentioned this before, but WCAC, when it comes to football, you know, the Catholic conference in, in the DC area is about as deep as any conference you're going to find around the country. I mean, obviously certain States have, you know, more complete uh, football situations in this area, but, uh, but at least in the DMV, that's probably about as good as you're going to find competition week in week out. And he was a three time all conference guy. Um, you know, a great cornerback at the same position as Larry Tarver, you know, for a second, you're like Maryland lost a recruit. Then they get a guy back. That's probably of a similar, if not maybe better caliber in my personal opinion. Um, he's a guy that I would look at as, as a possible sleeper pick and, you know, they got another signing um, on the day that they didn't necessarily have going in. Um, three-star offensive lineman Logan Bennett from St. Francis, which is where you know his running back Dewan Williams came from. Even though Williams was out with an ACL injury this year, but uh, is there anything other than the Braden Lee thing, in your opinion, that that maybe surprised you? I know the Braden Lee, there was a lot of talk about it. It wasn't necessarily super surprising, but did anything surprise you about Maryland's class and the way signing day went down? I mean, if if you kind of just look at the class as a whole, and I mentioned this before, and I'll say it again, it was it was really clear again that Loxley was trying to go after positions of need on the offensive line in the secondary, and I think he accomplished that, uh, especially de- uh, depth wise. Um, so I, I don't think there was anything that glaring or that shocking uh, going in. Um, I know that there was th- that there were rumblings of maybe Jeremiah Mar- Marcellin, a, a, a pit commit uh, from the same school as Lar- as Lar- as Larry Tarver, possibly flipping. He didn't. So that stood out a little bit, but as a whole, I don't really think there were too many surprises. I actually think the the, the more important uh, part uh, for Maryland over these past few days, few weeks, has been what they've been able to do in the transfer portal. 
uh, kind of filling in gaps. And I think we should probably talk about that uh, for a few minutes. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, before we get into the transfer portal, Jeremiah Marcellin was, uh, he gave us the good old throwing of the hat, the Maryland yeah. hat. Um, you're, it feels like you're always good for that if you're uh, if you're a school, to, you know, to get your hat thrown by a recruit who's who's not coming to your school. Um, and he sounded like he was really, you know, up don't until know. the final yeah. moments. I mean, yeah. I don't know if it was his coach or his dad. I, I couldn't tell who it was. Um, someone speaking at his uh, at his the ceremony at his school was saying, you know, we had everything prepared as if he was going to Maryland, but he changed his mind and decided to stick with Pitt. But uh, but yeah, best of luck to him. Let's talk about the transfer portal. Um, Maryland announced the signing of four players today on Thursday. Um, two of them were already committed and we'll talk about them first. And then there's a third guy as well. Um, MJ Morris leads probably the group in terms of, you know, what we're most expecting to, to make a, a noticeable impact immediately. Um, and he's a quarterback as well. So, you know, obviously with Talia gone, um, I know you guys, you and Colin, you know, talked a bit about the transfer portal and everything going on, but, but now that MJ Morris is officially on board, officially signed with Maryland, I think he's going to get an opportunity to practice a little bit with the team ahead of the bowl. Um, just, you know, what do you think MJ Morris, you know, maybe brings this to this team? And do you think, you know, he potentially could be the starter next year? Uh, he brings depth and competition um, to, 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 to next year's quarterback room. I, I think it's pretty clear barring anything unforeseen or, or injuries. It's going to be MJ Morris, B- Billy Edwards and, uh, and Cam Edge probably competing for the starting job uh, to have experience starting a power five school, to have a winning record uh, doing so like MJ Morris does. Um, obviously, I think having that experience, it, it can't it can't hurt. Um, at the very least, it will it will increase the competition um, um, amongst that room. But it's a good get uh, for Maryland. It's it's good to have it official, as we've seen in the past few days. Nothing official, even if it is official, is official. <laughs> um, pretty crazy. You really have to. It's like three. There's like three different commitments. It almost feels like right. You, but yeah. uh, but regardless, uh, a good get for Maryland. We talked a lot about him um, on the last pod, but um, to have it official is definitely an encouraging sign. Yeah, and we should probably talk about uh, Leah Tungavailoa opting out of the. Bowl oh yeah. yeah, you know MJ Morris won't be playing in the bowl game because you know that you know that's not necessarily how the eligibility rules start. But uh, but Billy Edwards is probably going to start the bowl game yeah. um, because Talia Tungavailoa, his career is officially over at least at Maryland. Um, he decided to opt out. Um, Mike Loxley told everyone, told us uh, the media contingent on Tuesday um, at the bowl media day that Talia will not play in the bowl game. Um, I don't think this is particularly too surprising. I think some people, you know, maybe thought he was going to play because he's not going to be a super high NFL draft pick. Yeah. He doesn't necessarily feel like he has too much to lose, but at the same time, you know, he's making the decision for himself and, you know, yeah. can't necessarily blame him, but it is an opportunity. Um, and I'll let you get your thoughts on it as well. But, but in my opinion, it's probably best for the team long-term, at least to have this happen. Um, it sucks for, you know, the fans that are going to Nashville and, you know, paying their money to see the team they wanted to see Talia one last time. But uh, who always want to see Billy Edwards. He's no, he's. I mean, Billy Billy time. Edwards is exciting, but this kind of gets to my point: is that uh, you know, long term to get an early look at game action against a different team with Billy Edwards and Cam Edge, and, and you know, maybe some of these other guys on the roster like Jaden Sare or you know, even Champ Long or whatever. Maybe you know, getting a snap or two. Um, it's just good long term to you know get a look at those guys in game action before the spring game, and you know, kind of get a gauge of where they stand, especially when you have another guy with starting experience coming into the program. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with you. Like I, I'm specifically really excited to see Cam Edge play. Um, he's a guy we have, we haven't really seen this year and a guy's probably going to be competing for the starting job. So I think to see him in person, you know, uh, against a, an SEC team in Auburn, I think that will be um, really telling, but I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a really fascinating next few months uh, in that quarterback room. Cause I really do think it's anyone's job. It feels like it's definitely anyone's job. And, you know, obviously the coaches, you can't necessarily trust everything they say, but I do believe Loxley when he says, you know, it's an open competition. Yeah, We're not yeah, giving absolutely. anyone scholarships by promising them a starting job or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I think that's, you know, probably going to be a battle that plays its way all the way through fall camp. And I would yeah. assume it'll probably be fall until we have an idea who's going to be the starting quarterback next year. No, I'm not even going to give a prediction because I genuinely don't know. I, I I think MJ Morris probably has the most upside. I think Billy Edwards is probably the safest option. And we just don't know a lot about Cam Edge. Yeah, and Cam Edge, you know, highly rated recruit yeah. when he was, you know, coming out of high school just a couple, you know, two years ago or so. So, you know, he's got a lot of potential as well. He was pretty impressive at the spring game, you know, whatever you can take from that. But, uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, we'll, we'll get a good look at them in Nashville in, uh, in just about over a week. Um, let's talk about the rest of the transfers coming in for Maryland. Um, and let's talk about the offensive line. You know, we talked about the offensive yeah. line with the high school recruiting, but, uh, but Maryland really making an emphasis in the transfer portal as well so far with the offensive line. 
Obviously, there are more transfers to come. We know that they're going to be guys leaving. They're going to be guys coming in. Um, Antoine Littleton announced today, or he didn't announce, but it was reported at least that uh, he's probably going to enter the transfer portal. So, you know, guys are leaving. But then right after that, um, Maryland signs two offensive linemen. Um, and yeah, and they 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 had Josh Kaltenberger, who was a uh, you know a, a recruit from uh, from Purdue. He's transferring in, and then you're bringing in two more offensive linemen. You're bringing in Alu Ba from Georgia and Alan Heron from uh, from Shorter University, which is Division two school. But uh, but don't let that fool you. Very highly recruited guy was committed to Penn State, flips to Maryland, and signs. Um, so yeah, you know Maryland making an emphasis to build itself up in the trenches. You get a guy like Ba that you know played at an SEC school, was a highly touted recruit. Obviously, you know, didn't play as much as he wanted or else he wouldn't be leaving, but uh, but a guy that has a lot of upside. And then uh, and then Heron as well, you know, if Penn State's all over you on the offensive line, you can trust that they probably have a pretty good evaluation. Colton Berger, a center is a position that they're going to need to replenish. So, you know, when you look at that, you know, what you see is what they did in the high school recruiting aspect is, you know, they're emphasizing this offensive line with potentially losing four starters or so this year. Um, it's a position of need and it's really good to see them prioritizing it. Yeah, I I have been shy to to critique Mike Loxley on this podcast, but but on paper, what he's done over the past few days with the offensive line between the recruits and the transfers, it looks like a plus work. It 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 really does. Um, you know, the team's losing four of its starters, and we haven't even discussed DJ Glaze, who may or or may not uh return. Um, but still, I mean, you you get three guys. Um. Kaltenberger at center, major position of need. You get Ba, a, for, a former four-star uh, recruit, obviously goes to Georgia. And I trust Kirby Smart. If he's recruiting a kid, he's got to be pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when it comes to talent evaluation, you know, it's it's Kirby and Saban. And you're like, yeah. if you're playing for either of those schools, you can trust that they're yeah. a pretty good player. Uh, yeah, and then and then Heron, you uh, you mentioned was was initially committed uh, to Penn State. You know, Maryland Maryland flips him was you know a highly touted transfer prospect, a uh, a uh, 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 a top ten uh, transfer offensive line um, rank, and then you get you know uh, and then you get seven offensive line through the um, you know just through recruiting. And I think in a in a perfect world, I think Loxley would probably plan to have those three guys. Starting and then maybe redshirt a couple of the new guys. He talks a lot about about the development of the position. So I think if if it, if all goes perfect, right, you you get three experienced guys um to put on the line. You're able to redshirt maybe three or four, two or three of of the new guys coming in. But to get experienced guys, to get to to get Kaltenberger, guy who guy who played in the Big Ten, Ba, guy who played in Georgia, and then Heron, a guy who you know who dominated at at the, at the Division two level. I think that this was a very productive uh, c- couple of days for uh, for Mike Loxley. Yeah, and, you know, DJ Glaze, we'll see if he comes back. If he comes back, you know, that's your starting left tackle yeah. coming back, which would be huge. You know, I asked him on Tuesday, I asked him specifically, are you thinking about coming back? Have you made that decision? He says, I don't know. There's pros and cons to both <laughs> decisions. You know, I don't think he's made up his mind what he's doing yet. Um, so we'll see with him. But what would he be? I'm, I'm, would he be what? A probably a uh, third or fourth round pick if he went into the draft right now yeah i mean he he could probably get selected probably in those middle rounds if he went yeah. you know he could also transfer if he you know wanted to uh to you know work on his game somewhere else you yeah. know so kind of all options on the table for dj glaze but you know we'll, we'll i guess you know we'll see what happens with him there's there's a couple other guys making that decision as well you know whether or not they're going to go to the nfl um but we'll see most of those come after the the bowl game which is you know on the 30th so probably after the new year's when we'll we'll start to see those decisions kind of start rolling in. Um, and interestingly, Talia is not playing in the bowl game, but nothing on his end yet, just kind of an aside. Um, Loxley made the announcement. Talia hasn't put out a statement or anything. So, you know, he's going to the NFL draft and through that process. We know that's going to happen because that's the next step for him. He's out of eligibility, but it will definitely be interesting to see what happens with that. Um, Jalen Husky is also signed with Maryland, a cornerback from Bowling Green, an all-conference guy. Um, kind of reminds me a little bit of Jaquan Shepard, just purely because not necessarily because of what he does on the field, but purely because a guy who is a, you know, an all conference player and maybe a little bit of a smaller conference, but then, you know, coming into Maryland and looking to make an impact. Uh, the secondary has also been a position that they've been emphasizing. We talked about, uh, I just talked about Husky, but then we also, you know, J, uh, Brandon Jacob, the safety from Florida was their highest rated recruit so far. Um, and then you're bringing in guys, you know, we, we mentioned, we mentioned a couple of them, Jenkins, um, Forgive me because I'm forgetting some of the names. I believe Lloyd Irvin as well is a cornerback. Um, you know, a couple okay. guys in that class. Yeah. Braden Lee, obviously, is a, is another defensive back. So, you know, you, you got a couple guys in that class. Secondary seems like, in addition to offensive line, maybe the position that they are prioritizing the most. 
because you also look at what you might be losing there. Bo Brady's gone after the bowl game. He is going to play. Tarheeb still is probably not playing. I don't think he's playing in the bowl game. He hasn't been practicing with the team, and he's declaring for the NFL draft. Jaquan Shepard is uh, is out of eligibility, I believe. And then Corey Coley um, is off to NC State, where Tamarcus Cooley is going as well. So, you know, you, you got a couple positions there that, that you need to fill up in that secondary as well. And, you know, he, you, you said it yourself. We, we've criticized sometimes Mike Loxley for the way he's assembled these rosters. But I think when you look at at least the intention behind the way that they're recruiting, the kind of players that they're adding, it's kind of hard to knock him for at least the way he's he's putting these classes together. And you can at least see the potential for this for these, you know, the, these units to, to really improve yeah. at least maybe not immediately, but at least, you know, in the near future to kind of get back to these levels that they're at now. Yeah, no, and you mentioned the, the potential, and and this kind of seems I don't want to say a recurring theme, but we kind of seems like every every Maryland class they they have they kind of target positions of needs, but potential it's a little bit of a, of a of a broken word kind of right because in the current state of college football you 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 look look at the guys they lost in the transfer portal this year Maryland right you lose some of the cornerstones of of, of their prior classes you know like a Jay Sean Barham like a Corey Dicious so the potential is definitely there it's just will that all come to fruition and we we just don't know right so we can't speculate we can only we can only just say what we see on paper and just do we think will it translate or not yeah and we don't know also you know nowadays to really hammer this idea home we don't know how many of these guys are going to be on the team in a year or two you know, you know, when you look at, especially through the high school recruiting, I mean, you know, now guys can transfer as many times as they want and they don't have to worry about sitting out or anything like that. But, uh, but even so it's a little less likely for guys to do that. Normally when you're transferring, you're transferring to a school where you think you're going to have a better opportunity, but especially through the high school recruiting. I mean, you know, we can look at these guys and say, these are the highest rated guys. You know, these are the guys that we think are going to make an impact. And you don't know. I mean, it's kind of a little bit of a crapshoot. You know, you have an idea with some of the guys, like I said, some of the higher rated guys tend to pan out at a higher rate. But it's not necessarily a guarantee. It's anything but it. And you don't necessarily know who's going to be on the team, who's going to perform, who's going to earn their, some, their self's playing time. So, you know, it's kind of a wait and see situation. But, uh, but you know, you will have an early look at some of the guys. I think, uh, was it eight eight or nine guys are enrolling early? That's nine. kind of, yeah, nine, nine guys, guys yeah. are enrolling and then also, early. And just not just to make, because I know you mentioned the uh, the cornerbacks that we forgot to mention, the Kai Rowling was another uh, cornerback that Maryland landed. I just want to add that in there. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a position where they're really emphasizing it and they were able to kind of piece it together this year a little bit, even though you lost Deontay Banks, Jacory and Bennett to the draft. But, uh, but once again, you know, you're kind of always replenishing, especially nowadays with the transfer portal and everything, but yeah, some of these guys enrolling early, you know, you get a little bit of an earlier look at them, maybe an idea of who's going to play, who isn't, but, uh, but you know, it, it, once again, we don't really know on signing day right now, everyone's optimistic, you know, not everyone's optimistic. Florida is not optimistic right now, the way their signing day went. But, you know, like most schools are, you know, look at their recruiting class and say, you know, these guys are going to be good. These guys are going to be good. These guys are going to stay here. They can imagine them staying for four years and and they just don't. So, you know, we, we look at this class and we see a lot of upside on it. We see some of the three-star guys that maybe are coming in with a little bit less promise of, of immediate playing time, and maybe a little bit more willing to stay around. But uh, But as you look at it right now, you know, it's kind of a little bit of guesswork, but uh, but I think on paper, this this class that they put together so far, at least through high school, through the transfer portal has been uh, has been pretty optimistic, at least from my end. Yeah, no, agree. And I think the, the main theme, right, that fact that Loxley was able to keep all but but one out of out of 20 recruits, I think is an incredibly positive sign, especially with all the all, all the flips that we saw in signing days out some other schools. Yeah. And once we get um, a little bit of a conclusion of this whole Jordan Seton saga yeah. we we can maybe update it a little bit more but i guess we should talk about it because even though they signed <laughs> all these guys it's still tracks. the biggest story probably going on at least in recruiting in maryland circles right now jordan seaton the number one offensive lineman in this class was committed to colorado committed on national tv and then he kind of has backed off the recruitment he still hasn't officially decommitted from the school but the fact that he didn't sign yesterday is somewhat telling that he's at least torn feels like maryland's really in it um, there's reports that are, you know, public reports. I'm not stealing anyone's information here. It was all that, made public yesterday. Yeah. yeah. That, that, uh, he was on campus last weekend, you know, kind of quietly visiting. He's from the area. He, before he went down to IMG Academy in Florida, he was at St. John's, which is, you know, uh, Maryland has a commit in this class from St. John's Shamar McIntosh was the one guy who didn't sign. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Cause you know, St. John's guys don't tend to enroll early. So, you know, he'll probably just sign in February, but that's where Rakim Jarrett went. He was a late flip. Um, that's where uh, Antoine Littleton is transferring out, but you know, he went there as well. Um, Colby McDonald went there, I think as well. So, you know, you, you have this connection to this local powerhouse. That's where he was before he goes down to IMG. And now it feels like it 
maybe a Colorado Maryland battle, maybe Oregon Tennessee Oregon, kind of yeah. in the mix, but uh, but yeah, if, if Maryland can land Jordan Seaton, all this talk that we had, I won't say it goes out the window because it all still stands, but uh, but then there you have your cornerstone of this class, and you know a guy that maybe could you know start as a freshman on the offensive line, which is incredibly rare, especially in the Big Ten. Yeah, no, and it's 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 such a crazy situation, right? Because we just we I don't even I don't even know if he knows where he's going, right? And when you have literally the entire college football world basically all with all 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 their eyes just directed to, uh, towards this kid, and you know he committed to Colorado on on national television um, with Skip Bayless, so we had all the all, all all the energy there. But um, no, but like you mentioned, it from from reports that that were made public, it kind of looks like Oregon and Tennessee are there, which. It's probably worrisome for Maryland because what those two schools have a lot of, which Maryland doesn't have, is money. Um, <laughs> to, to be honest, um, but yeah, uh, Loxley, I, he was he was the Maryland was the first school to offer Jordan Seaton four years ago. Um, so the relationship is definitely there. He would be the second highest Maryland recruit in the modern era, uh, only behind I think third Stephon. third highest by composite rankings, at least. Oh, by composite rankings. Well, third highest beside be, behind Stefan Diggs and Jared. Wesley Jefferson. And Wesley Jefferson. Okay. So, um, yeah, it would be a, uh, I don't know if a, if a program changing move is, but, but you can, I don't think you can say that, but to be, a, if they are able to, uh, to flip a guy who's being talked to by Oregon and Tennessee and committed to a Deion Sanders school, it would definitely be uh, very large for Mike Loxley in the program. Huge, and uh, <laughs> and and I'll leave us with this, you know, because this is obviously a, you know, by the time that this goes up Friday morning, you know, who knows? Maybe we have some sort of conclusion on this, so you know, we Six don't want to harp on it too much. into Oregon. Exactly, you know, who knows what's going to happen, and you know, we don't want any super outdated stuff. But uh, but yeah, you can't like you said it, like you can't deny the aspect of this being you know coach prime's team that he's committed to the whole media you know i, I don't know if i want to use the term circus but like the whole you media situation circus. going on with you know with Deion sanders and you know colorado and who you know he was blocking for Shadur sanders who's obviously a superstar in his own right because of you know who his dad is and the fact that he's a really good quarterback and you know, where he plays and everything if you can flip a guy from there you you've gotten past signing day where you know all the the drama already happened with with you know some of these guys you know, deciding where to flip and everything, you know, he'll be the story of the day in college football. Maryland will be the story of the day in college football. If that happens, it'll be the story of the week. Potentially. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will just say this, like, I don't understand the, I, the, the concept of Maryland orchestrating these flips behind the scenes oh, the and doing it the day after signing day, because why would you not want a guy like that on board earlier to try and encourage other guys? But that all aside, if they can pull this off, who knows if they will, they're supposedly in the mix. You know, he hasn't decided yet at the time of this recording. Um, if they can pull this off, it's huge. It's a position of need, which is even bigger. And, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of guy that can, can help, you know, really accelerate you. And even with a guy like Tolio leaving, even with some key pieces leaving can, can really help set you up positively for the future. Can you, I, I just, I was thinking about this when we were speaking to Loxley the other day, could you imagine just during, Everything during the whole commitment, the signing day process. Could you imagine being a coach or be, be being in the coach's room during signing day when when you work for years and years trying to you know get a certain kid kid to commit, and then in a span of two minutes they can just kind of change all of that? To me, it's just such a crazy concept, and I just couldn't imagine that when we saw the dozens and dozens and dozens of flips. Yeah, I mean, it you know it happens every year, and especially yeah. nowadays with NIL, you know, being a factor, um, you know, it, it feels especially transactional, but. Uh, yeah, it is transactional. Yeah, I mean, you know, my take on it is that, you know, like I'm not going to knock a kid for making a decision. Obviously, you know, yeah, no, we, no, no, we no, 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 this sometimes because, yeah. you know, these kids are superstars sometimes, you know, even coming out of high school. You know, these are 17, 18 year old kids making decisions that are really going to affect them for their whole life. But yeah. when I look at a guy like Jordan Seaton, yeah, why go on national TV and commit two weeks before signing day if you don't actually know you're going to go there? I mean, I know it helps build your image and stuff, but, uh, there's no need to commit. I mean, you can favor a school. You could tell the coach I'm thinking about coming there, but to do the whole public thing where you're going to commit to a school and then, you know, you decide to change it like a couple weeks later, you know, if he hasn't decided yet where he's going, he probably hadn't really decided yet then either. 
I, I'm a little bit more understanding well, of a guy like a Braden Lee that decided back in April, you know, and a lot happened. And, you know, now it's a totally different situation now in December and, you know, things have changed, but, you know, changing, changing your mind in just like a couple of weeks, um, it, you know, it feels, I don't know. I don't know exactly what the word is I'm looking for, but, uh, but I'm not sure I totally understand that decision. Well, no, I, I agree with you in your, in your opinion, but, but I think from a player's perspective, I think that that building their brand is is almost as, if not more important, than building themselves up as a football player, right? There, there, there's just there's frankly there's so much money where they can be able to support that not not only themselves but their family in building their brand and their NIL, and if they have the opportunity to do so, I think they're 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 going to do that, right? And for a guy like Jordan Seaton to go on to go on Fox Sports and to create a whole social media friends frenzy and be trending number one on Twitter for forty eight hours. That's going to help him in the in the long run, possibly, maybe in his mind, and it's going to help him build build himself up. So you have to understand that. But I agree with you, which I don't, I, I respect it. I'm just I'm just not sure it makes the most sense, right? If if that's the best way to put it. Yeah, and you know, it's you can't get in the mind of, yeah. of these kids, and you know, I'm thinking, you know, a couple of years ago when I was deciding where to go to college, you know, I did that. Yeah. A million people in yeah. my face, you know, telling yeah. me to go here and offering me money to go here and playing yeah. time and all that stuff, you know. So it's obviously a very different, different, uh, different situation that you know pretty much anybody that's that's listening to the show ha- has been in, and you know yeah. even people who are recruited to college twenty years ago, it's totally different now. You know nowadays the game has changed with social media, with NIL, with the portal. You know coaches are recruiting differently nowadays. You know everything's totally changed, and it you know it's a confusing landscape, and it's really fast moving. I know these last two <laughs> days or so for us, yeah. you know. Don't say that uh, that that writing about sports isn't a sport. <laughs> you know, it was incredibly uh, incredibly hectic and uh, and and very tiring, but uh, but really uh, exciting uh, to, to keep a track keep keep track of as we you know go along with this early signing period, which ends yeah. tomorrow. Another note I should put before we go on Jordan Seaton, um, and just really for anyone, is that you know the early signing period ends tomorrow. So um, if you don't decide by tomorrow. Well, I shouldn't say if you don't decide. If you don't sign yeah. by tomorrow, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to wait until February to sign. You can commit, you know, to a, to a school in that yeah. period, but uh, but you can't at least put pen to paper. Is there is there a time deadline for tomorrow, or is it just by like eleven fifty nine p.m.? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm not sure there is, but uh, but there might be because I know that uh, yesterday was uh, it was seven a.m. was was when players could uh, could start start signing. But uh, but regardless, you know, this next twenty four hours or so for the few players that are you know at the top of those rankings that remain unsigned you know this is kind of it's going to be a frenzy for them yeah. it can be a frenzy for us it can be a frenzy for anyone that's interested in recruiting and you know <laughs> i don't yeah. know i guess we'll just wait and see you know yeah. we know no one really knows what's going on you know all the insiders don't really know what's going on either so uh so yeah that's kind of well, i guess our roundup of uh of, of maryland's early signing period andrew anything to say before we yeah, get just a little personal message to jordan please make a decision now because it has been a very tiring a uh, few days for the both of us uh so just please and so I, I can take my mind off sonics I'm, I'm sure at the top of uh jordan seaton's mind i'm sure is you know how are the podcasters around the country you know reacting to this but uh but regardless uh thank you all for listening um if you're looking for any breaking news you know obviously go over to testudotimes.com we got a live signing day and signing period tracker over there we got stories for every recruit you know we got updates on transfer portal and all that going on as well Um, Once again, thanks everyone for listening. Support has been awesome throughout football season. We got the bowl game coming up. Basketball is at UCLA on Friday night. And then, you know, you got one game until big 10 play really kicks into the gear. That's going to be really interesting to see, you know, we'll we'll talk (laughs) a lot about uh, how that's going, you know, moving forward, but, uh, but thanks everyone for listening so much and we will see you soon.